So Avgeek Joe says, can we please have a Ukraine map? Unfortunately, probably not. It's just too sensitive right now. Yeah, you got to be careful too with uh, yeah. like hot geopolitical stuff. I mean, yeah, like, Ukraine, nice. Taiwan, uh, those are kind of no go areas for us right now. I'm afraid. It's just country yeah. blue and country red, right? Yeah. 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 When will we get a dynamic campaign like Falcon Four? I'm not. I don't know Falcon, Remember. but it seems Thanks, pretty Remember. dynamic as it is. Yes. Thank you. Um, it's a. Well, we have missions, campaigns, and such, but the campaigns are scripted. They're basically missions tied together in a kind of story format. But we are, and we have been actively for the past uh, few years now, working on the no kidding dynamic campaign. Oh, wow. It is is that like the old Janes where you have like a newsreel no, and all that stuff? No, or? even Janes, we never really had any dynamic campaign, so to speak. So okay. like if you... Think of it this way, that you have almost have two different layers. You have a, a strategic layer where, you know, side A and side B, they have a pool of assets, they have industry, they have production, and they have uh, objectives. And they say, okay, I have objective A, here are my resources to take it, here's what I'm going to throw against it, uh, here's what I'm going to need, I'm going to generate an ATO based on that. Then as a player, I look at my ATO, Say, oh, okay, I want to fly this interdiction in a, a strike eagle uh, to hit this um, uh, logistics line behind enemy lines. And you fly it, and then that all has then a repercussion on an ongoing dynamic campaign. Wow. Yeah. That You're literally amazing. building like a parallel universe. <laughs> you are. You're basically <laughs> you're building an RTS on top of a, a, a vehicle simulation. That's wild. Yeah. yeah. It, we're not too far away from virtual OPRs, folks. <laughs> Everybody's going to have to fill out what they did, do the Christmas party. It's all, it's, it's coming. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's on its way. As long as I get a virtual uh, coffee Ar cup. Archeronian's back and says, easily my favorite episode you, so sir. far. Thank you. Uh, just hosted a DCS tournament this weekend. That's a good point. Awesome. Wow. Have you, Thank you. What have you thought about the tournaments and stuff? I mean, because I know we've done mm -hmm. some fights on Folds of Honor. You guys have supported yep. that, and I appreciate it. But what have you thought about kind of how the community has created this kind of competitive atmosphere? Well, uh, I, you know, I've said, I know Nick has said it a million times, but we wouldn't be where we are with that without this community. Because I've, you know, I play all sorts of games and different game communities, but never seen one as passionate as this one. And, you know, whether it's, you know, all the different guys running their own servers, because we actually don't run any of our own public servers. This is all the community running the servers, and they put a tremendous amount of time, you know, buying the hardware, uh, running this, uh, buying the server space, creating the missions, maintaining them. Uh, yeah. It's a massive amount of work. And, and they don't get compensated by us. That's yeah, I, I, that's them. I will yeah. shout out Fox Three for that because they provided yeah, our go. server for what we did, and yeah, right, it's yeah. awesome. Because I don't know, it's I was working at some point on my computer, then it stopped mm -hmm. working, and then Fox Three was like, "Hey, we can help you," and it's all turnkey. So mm -hmm. thanks to those guys for for doing that. Um, or, or, I mean, this is almost becoming a Q&A because everybody's so say. Wags is a popular man. <laughs> no. uh, thank you for your work, Wags. What is next in the pipeline coming soon? Can you even tell us? Or I can. Know? Actually, it was dominating most of my work day today, and that's the Chinook. Awesome. Ooh. Yes. Oh, so, so is that another, like the Huey, like a Bell Textron? Like who, who I think is it's developing a, that? Well, we're developing it, but I think originally it's a, I think it's a Boeing helicopter. And we're going to be doing yeah. the, uh, the Foxtrot, which is the glass cockpit version. Oh, yeah. Nice. So this has been a really interesting one because, you know, um, one of the biggest challenges of doing, whether it's a four-gen aircraft or the H-64, which we we're doing right now, is reference documentation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, anything we put in the game, if, you know, the black sedan pulls up in front of my <laughs> house tomorrow... <laughs> I need to be able to say to them, how do you know this that you could put it in your game? Yeah. So I have to be able to go to some public source, even to some dark corner of the internet. I need to be able to put my finger on it. So until we can, uh, we have enough information to build the aircraft, we can't do it. Because now granted, you know, maybe for an older aircraft, you know, you have a century series or something like that, but for a four gen, God, much less a fifth gen, uh, we have to be incredibly diligent about having our ducks align 
about what goes in the sim. I was surprised with the Apache because of how much you got. I mean, it's such yeah. a complicated helicopter. Yeah. And not as widely exported as, say, a Viper or a Hornet. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, that had to be a big challenge. Uh, well, good or bad yeah, is what it is. But the uh, Dash 10, kind of like uh, the Army's version of a uh, kind of a combination of a, uh, a Dash 1 and a Dash 34, uh, went public back in, I think, around 2010 or so of a okay. circa 2005 H64D Block 2. And it's just everywhere on the internet right now. So, so you have to be go ahead. you have to be super careful with your subject matter experts, yeah. you know, with them like, hey, this is not because you and I have even talked about the F-16. Yeah, absolutely. Every time I say, hey, it doesn't do that. You're like, show me the reference where I don't go yep. to jail. <laughs> yeah. And this is not a knock on any of my uh, cockpit monkey friends out there. But <laughs> sometimes memories fade. Confusion between what? two aircraft might happen. So Never. whenever we can, we really try to you know look at the actual no kidding reference data yeah. and then use input from SMEs as a kind of a big picture to make sure everything kind of jives together. And once we have that kind of um, consolidation of documentation, SME feedback, then we feel really good about something to go ahead and make it happen. I feel personally attacked. Well, yeah. <laughs> I feel like you oh, read no, 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 no. Trust me, I'm, I'm talking about uh, yeah. many other instances, mover, not you. Bikes, how do you guys figure he out? He says like, on your channel, just so we're clear. Right. <laughs> on Gonky's channel, it's totally different. Go ahead, Gonky. Bikes, how do you guys figure out like what what you want to model next? I mean, mm. what, so, what drives it? And then yeah. I, if you could like, how do you guys get funding? For, I'm just curious. Like, how, like, do you guys raise raise money to? No, it's all capital that we you know okay. make through our sales of the modules. So in terms of what we do, it's, it's a combination of factors. Uh, the first, which you know, kind of just touched on was, you know, do we have the reference documentation to mm -hmm. do it? You know, even you know, like uh, we're working on the Hellcat right now. Uh, obviously that's not a sensitive aircraft, but you know, still we have to find the information. We have to find, you know, like the, the wind tunnel data for the flight model. Ideally we could find some, you know, um, some veterans that flown uh, the Hellcat that we could talk to about his handling. Uh, maybe there's some private operators that we can um, talk with about it. So again, it's finding that information. If we can't find the information, it's, it's, it's essentially no go. Okay. Uh, so you have a list of aircraft and you're just, uh, you know, if you can, I mean, have you had airplanes where you're like, oh, we just can't do this one because there's not, yeah, not stuff out there. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. And then the next part is, you know, it's this is a business, of course. Is do right. people want to fly it? Um, you know, there's you know a ton of aircraft. <laughs> you do. No, we do. There goes you. <laughs> there goes Wombat. Wombat would be your only customer. <laughs> So, it, 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 you know, there's a huge amount of investment in, in these, as you might imagine. Yeah. So at the end of the day, there has to be a return on investment yep. that we're not in the red or uh, much less break it even. You know, we got people to pay salaries to take care of. So is it going to sell? Uh, that's a big one. Um, then I guess the, the last big one is um, do our other teams potentially working on already? You know, this mostly goes into the th third parties, but there may be a third party working on F whatever. Another third party may come and say, hey, I want to do this aircraft. But we last thing we want to do is, you know, waste people's time working on something that someone else is already doing. So kind of those are the kind of the big three that will determine uh, what yeah, we can razor. do. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, man. It says, Wags, it's time to get the Tomcat D <laughs> and the Intruder. Yeah. Well, you'll have to talk to uh, our friends at Heepler about that, but um, yeah. they're just an awesome developer. And, um, you know, I know they're obviously working on the Truder. Uh, they got the AI model coming first, which looks uh, outstanding. Uh, I think probably, the, uh, and again, uh, I'm sure the guys, my friends at Heepler will correct, correct me if I'm wrong. The biggest issue with the, the D on the Tomcat is the data, again, is, yeah. you know, they have to find... Uh, that information out there. Obviously, we're not flying uh, Ds anymore, but still, um, a lot of those documents, particularly say the TAC uh, manual, uh, which uh, I believe is like um, the, the weapon systems for a Navy aircraft, uh, would have to be available. And I, and I just don't know if it is. So, yeah. Wags, one of the things I'm curious about, because I mm -hmm. got this comment like today, and okay. I always see this on these DCS videos of people or emails where they'll, they're, 
they're trying to come to me, right? And they're like, hey, okay. do yeah. you remember the Hornet or the Viper doing this? Right. Yeah. And they're usually in the weirdest flight regime that we never would have <laughs> ever, like, it's like, yeah. hey, did you put the gear down and the flaps to half and then paddle switch and how many Gs will it give you? And it's like, right. dude, why would I know that? Like, when yeah. in, in the world would I be out there doing that? But do you find that's an issue where people sometimes get upset because they believe that it should do something in a regime that we never get into? And, yeah, that's just, you know, kind of the nature of the beast with flight sims. You know, uh, customers are out there going to, you know, put the aircraft in situations that a real pilot would never do. And, um, and, and, and it happens sometimes where the physics may break down or the system's just not uh, coded to account for, you know, this radar mode at this setting and whatever um it it happens just you know the amount of possible permutations of all the different systems um you know every now and then yeah you're gonna you're gonna come into uh, situations that we don't account for then you know we ask for a track file we ask for a good description uh and we can reproduce it and then we'll put it into what we call our, our jira system and we'll put a priority and based on how important it is to our customers as a whole We'll sign a priority, and then we'll fix it. Now, just oh, for wow. clarification, these track files, are you mm -hmm. reviewing their mission no matter what? Like, are you looking at, like, everything that's submitted, do you guys look at, or is it based off of what they submit that you, like, is it, like, your no. call is important to us, everything gets looked at, or is it more of a, hey, we look at it to see how realistic it is based on what they just told you? So what usually happens when someone submits a bug, um, let's say they, they put a bug in about the seeker at the M120. Um, what we'll do is we'll, um, we'll, right at the start, we'll ask for a track file because what will hap often happen is the <laughs> customer will kind of in text talk about the bug, but we can't reproduce it. The best mm -hmm. way to reproduce it is actually a track file that we can run in our system and see actually what happens. And then we can actually, then if we can reproduce it on our end, then we can give it to one of our engineers and they can actually run it through the debug code and see exactly what happens line by line and locate the problem that way. So I know a lot of uh, customers complain about having to make track files, but it really is worth its weight in gold in terms of being able to uh, find and fix problems. Uh, the key is making them as short and to the point as possible. Yeah, yeah, because obviously a three-hour mission. Yeah, uh, well, not only that, it. but really long missions, you could have potential errors start to crop up in the track file, and it doesn't play back correctly. So, you know, the shorter, the better.